BBC Radio for Schools, Radio History 14 to 16, the cooperative movement. The sound of reggae music from a cooperative workshop in Hackney, London. It's one of a group of cooperatives set up by bootstrap enterprises to help young people create their own jobs and provide a service for the local community. In today's programme, we're going to look at the ideas behind cooperatives and, in particular, the co-op shop in the high street. But what is it that makes a cooperative different from other businesses? Tony Maris of the Cooperative Development Agency explains. Well, it's basically an organisation whereby people can get together and provide for themselves something which perhaps wasn't available or was available at a price that was too expensive in the past. A cooperative is different in that it's people getting together themselves. They may go and borrow money from elsewhere, but they themselves provide employment for themselves and share the rewards and any profits that the business might make between them. It's also a business in which the profits go back to the members. Today's cooperatives offer a wide range of services, from helping people to have their own homes to doing odd jobs like repairing motorbikes. They seem very different from the co-op store, which was set up to sell food. But at Bootstraps, Kevin Tunnard believes there are links between the ideas behind the original co-op store and today's cooperative workshops. There's one parallel in that they're set up to enable people very often to buy things that they can't afford, but it's one step removed. I mean, they, they don't set up a retail co-op uh, to, so that they can buy food like that. What they do is they set up a co-op so that they can create a way of earning themselves money and then go out and, and buy food. So in that way, I think it's very similar to the original co-ops. The ideas behind cooperatives go back a long way. Looking at accounts of working-class life in the 19th century, we can see how the original co-op store began and the difference it made to ordinary families. From the historical records, we've created the fictional family of the Whitakers. Patty Caldwell takes up their story. Henry Whitaker, his wife Alice and daughter Ada lived in Rochdale, Lancashire, in the early 1840s. Rochdale was a mill town. The factories produced cotton cloth. Henry worked in the spinning room at one of the mills. And I was luckier than many. At least I had a job. I'd been a handloom weaver, you see, making my own cloth at home. Then the cotton mills were built, turning out cloth faster and cheaper than we ever could. There were so many folks out of work that the employers could pick and choose who they'd take on. And they get rid of you too, just as easily if trade was bad. Whenever they could, the owners took on women and children in preference to men. They could pay them less, you see. Although they worked the same hours as the rest of us. Sixteen hours a day, maybe. Six days a week. Not my wife and daughter, though. I wouldn't have them working in one of those places. So I took in washing, minded other people's children, and did sewing for more wealthy folk. It was always a struggle to get enough money to cover food and rent. Saturday was payday at the factory. Name? Henry Whitaker. Uh, right, that's nine shillings. You've made a mistake. I usually get twice that. Uh, not this week. Half in cash, half in tokens. I don't want your tokens. They're as good as cash. Ah, oh, the heck. Where can we use them except at the factory shops? You can buy all you need there. At a price. Everything's more expensive in the company store. Everything's overpriced. Mr Whitaker, I don't own this factory. I'm paid to hand out the wages. I'm just doing my job. You either accept the tokens or you don't. It's not right. Lord knows they pay us little enough. Then they take back half of it by making us buy stuff from their own shops. More profits for the owner. Ah, well, then he'd argue that by keeping back some of your wages in cash, he can use that money to expand the business. And keep you in a job. Oh, I didn't realise he had my welfare so much at heart. <laughs> Such generosity. Look, I'm... there's others waiting in line to be paid. Will you accept the tokens or not? I've no choice, have I? If I don't take them, he'll put me out of a job. Right. So that's half cash, half tokens. Next. So part of Henry's wages continued to be paid in tokens. These could only be used in the Tommy shops, set up by the factory owners, who, of course, 
fixed the prices. This method of payment was known as the truck system, and it had been made illegal in 1831. But the owners managed to get round the law by saying that their workers could always refuse to accept the tokens. If they did, though, they might be dismissed. So men like Henry had little choice but to accept. The factory owners found other ways of profiting from the Tommy shops. Alice Whitaker knew all the tricks. The shopkeepers would put things in the food to make their goods go further. Flour was mixed with plaster of Paris or broken rice. Cocoa with brown earth. Tea with dried leaves that the shop owner had already used once. The other thing they'd do was swap your credit. Because the goods were so pricey, you'd often find yourself without enough tokens to buy the few basic things you needed. I'm not talking about luxuries. I'm talking about basic things like flour to make bread. So then the shopkeeper had you. Well, Mrs Whitaker, we could let you have one or two things on credit, just to help you out, like. Pay me back next week. Oh, that's very kind of you. My pleasure, Mrs Whitaker. Uh, of course, when you do pay up, I'll have to charge you a little bit extra <laughs> for the inconvenience. Well, in that case, maybe I won't bother. And then you'd look at the goods in your basket and think, that won't feed the three of us. And in the end, you'd say, all right, let me have some more flour on credit and I'll pay you back. The next week, you pay back what you owe, with a little bit extra, of course, and that leaves you short of tokens. So you ask for more credit. And if the whole thing goes on long enough, you end up owing so much that you hand over the whole week's wages just to pay off your debts and leave the shop with an empty basket. And that's how things were for people like us. Never being able to clear our debts, never seeing any hope of change. Then the factory where I was working closed down. There was a trading depression, they said. Couldn't afford to keep us on. My dad never accepted defeat easily, but this time he was beaten. With so many men out of work, he knew he wasn't going to find a job. So, my mum went to work on one of the power looms in the weaving shed, and I worked as a tenter, taking tangles or dirt from the cotton. Dad spent his days with the other unemployed men. They'd stand round on street corners, talking about the situation and what they could do to change it. One evening, he came home with a friend of his by the name of William Collins. They'd worked together at the mill before it closed down. Alice, Ada, I want you to meet Bill Collins. I'll do. I'll Come do. on in, Bill. Sit yourself down. Oh, you must be the person who's been filling his head with all these ideas about what's his name, Owen. Robert Owen, I, a fine man, Mrs Whitaker. A factory owner? Aye, but a bit different from the ones around here. How come? Well... Go on. For a start, he paid good wages at shorter working hours. And he built an entire village near his factory in Scotland yeah. uh, with schools and decent houses and, and shops selling quality goods at normal prices. He sounds like a rare specimen, Mr Collins, but what's he got to do with us? No one's going to turn the bosses round here into a Robert Owen. Uh, indeed not, but we believe that by following his ideas we can help to make things better for folk like us. How come? Uh, by getting people to cooperate with one another, not compete. I don't see why you're so caught up with this Robert Owen. Sounds like another dreamer, like you. The Rochdale men were inspired by the work of Robert Owen and his ideas of cooperation. But there'd been other similar experiments before. In 1825, Abram Coombe tried to set up a cooperative colony in Scotland, while in London, William Lovett became storekeeper of a cooperative trading society. Owen himself opened trading bazaars in London, where workers could exchange articles they'd made. None of these schemes lasted long, though. Perhaps Alice was right when she said that Owen was too much of a dreamer. But William Collins and his Rochdale friends had something very practical in mind. Well, some of us who used to work at the mill have thought of setting up our own store, a cooperative store. Working people owning a shop? Where's the money to come from? If we all put toppings a week in the kitty, we'll soon have enough to buy the foodstuffs we need. Well, that won't be easy. You're right. It won't be easy. But it's worth trying. We've got to help ourselves somehow, but no one will do it for us. Well, I've heard of these schemes before. They always fail. People buy things on credit and then don't pay back what they owe. We're only accepting cash, no credit. How will you get customers if you don't give credit? Well, people who buy from our shop can become members of the cooperative. 
And besides buying things cheaper, they'll also get a share of the money we make. A dividend. The divvy. Are you going to give back all the money you make? No. We'll decide on a fixed percentage. Anything left over once we've paid out the dividend will go towards buying more goods and expanding the business, I hope. <laughs> this dividend? When will people get it? Every three months. On Divi Day. Oh. That's when the share-out will take place. And the great thing, Alice, is that the more brass you spend, the more Divi you get. You'll be able to leave the Divi with us if you want to, like a savings bank. <laughs> Working people don't have savings. Up until now, they haven't. But here's a chance for them to start. What will you be selling? Well, it depends how much money we can raise to get going. But I tell you this much, the food we sell will be pure food. Well, I'm not convinced you can do it, but good luck to you. And if you're ever needing practical help, you've only to ask. With a lot of practical help and by putting aside weekly subscriptions, the Rochdale Weavers finally managed to set up their own business. Their aims were simple, to sell good food at reasonable prices and plough the money earned back into the business. But what about today's cooperatives? What's inspired young people in, say, Hackney to set up their own businesses? Well, I really wanted to be an electrician and I started doing a one day a week course but I wasn't working at the time. And then I saw an advert from Bootstrap who, who were thinking of setting up a co-op. So I eventually got in touch with them and we started the co-op after some talking. It's so ideal for me because I've got a young child and I couldn't work the hours that people normally work in the industry. So the co-op gave me a chance to have some control over my own hours. Well, it gives you a chance to do a variety of work. It means we can organise the work the way that suits us best. We work with each other rather than for an employer. Other people have developed cooperatives from their hobbies. Danny had had no luck in getting a job, so with a friend he decided to set up his own TV and radio repair shop. I just couldn't find myself. I just thought that um, I'd just do something for myself, you know, and let myself get the benefit of what I'm working for, yeah, instead of giving it to someone else. My friends would come around, wanted their hi fives repaired or something, and I'd do it, yeah. I just hope to God it worked. <laughs> All these young people were helped by bootstrap enterprises with loans to buy equipment, premises at a cheap rent and business advice. Back in Rochdale in the 19th century, there were also practical problems, like how to find the money to start the business. The weavers raised the sum of £28 by weekly donations and rented two rooms on the ground floor of a warehouse in Toad Lane. The rent was £10 a year. So, after doing repairs and buying some shop fittings, there was just enough money left over to buy some flour, sugar, butter, oatmeal and candles. They now called themselves the Rochdale Equitable Pioneers. They were ready for business on the evening of December 21st, 1844. Well, Mrs Whitaker, doesn't look much, eh? <laughs> but at least it belongs to the working people of this town. Our little shop is ready for opening. What if it fails, William? There's been so much jeering outside. The other shopkeepers in the town are certainly likely to lose hearts. Well, we're not going to. They're afraid we'll take their trade. One of them said he could carry off your entire stock on his wheelbarrow. Maybe, but look outside. There's crowds waiting to get in. Before long, we'll be able to expand the cooperative and provide people with houses and, and give our members and their children a better education. <laughs> Still a dreamer, I see. Uh, Mr Collins, <laughs> what I need to take down the shutters. Uh, right you are. Oh, Excuse me, won't you? <laughs> the Rochdale Society of Pioneers is about to open for business. <laughs> to begin with, the members did all the work serving in the shop the two nights each week it was open for business. They had their setbacks, to be sure. Local shopkeepers tried to organise against them. And whenever trade was bad, the co-op suffered too. But with a divvy of three pence paid to all members after the first three months, people kept coming. Alice, Ada and myself all took turn working in the shop, and we began to take great pride in its progress. Within five years, the Rochdale Pioneers were able to take over the whole building at 31 Toad Lane. They fitted up one room as a lending library, another as a reading room. They began to sell clothing and footwear and fresh meat, by 1851, they were open for business every day. Other cooperative societies were set up in the north of England and Scotland, and gradually throughout the rest of the country. They all followed the Rochdale example. Goods sold at low prices and a dividend paid back at intervals throughout the year, according to how much you'd spent. The societies were run by people elected by the members. One member, one vote, 
and they'd employ the staff to work in the stores. In 1863, cooperative societies in the north joined up to form the Cooperative Wholesale Society, the CWS. The idea was to buy goods in very large quantities and sell them to the various co-ops at lower prices than those charged by other wholesalers. Later they began to make their own goods. Biscuits to start with and boots and shoes. And later still, clothes, furniture, soap, glass, paint. They sold insurance too and opened a bank. But they were critics. The co-op! <laughs> There's plenty of us too poor to be able to shop there. They won't allow credit, will they? Getting too big for its own good, I'd say. Just like any other business. Out to make money. Ada Whitaker had criticisms of a different kind. Why is it that at all co-op meetings it's the women who are told to come and buy, but it's the men who are asked to come and help, vote, criticise and act? Oh, your mother's done a fair share in her time. Well, people don't listen to her like they listen to you. That's just the way things are, Ada, love. But it doesn't have to be. You've done as much for the society as anybody else, but none of the women ever come to the discussion group on a Sunday night where all the important decisions are made. But they've got a vote, Ada. That's what our society's all about, one member, one vote. If you're a member, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. you still got the vote. Well, what's the point of having the vote if you don't have any real say in what you're voting about? It's the men who decide what we should discuss. You don't know what you're talking about, Ada. Yes, I do. It's time us women stood up for ourselves. We're as important as the men, and we're more than half the nation. Ada was voicing ideas that later gave rise to one of the most important developments within the co-op movement, the founding of the Women's Cooperative Guild in 1882. This allowed women to become a power in the movement and to share in the way things were run. And cooperatives still provide opportunities for women to run a business. These two women have set up their own word processing bureau in Hackney, and they're confident working cooperatively has advantages. I think self-satisfaction more than anything, because you know you're, not, you're working for yourself, and it gives you more incentive to do the work. Why work for someone else when you can work for yourself? The, there's a challenge of proving to yourself and others how you can set a business up. It gives you a chance also to understand working in a group, you know, um, understanding other people as well as yourself. As the first cooperative store developed in Rochdale, those involved began to see the benefits. For the first time, we were able to buy wholesome food at reasonable prices. We were able to save, and we put the Tommy shops right out of business. Best of all, there was a feeling that we were helping ourselves, making real changes in society. I've worked at the Rochdale store ever since it was opened. I've got real business experience, which most working-class people like me have never had before. Cooperation has improved the life of all the working people I know. For me, cooperation means education. A library room at Toad Lane opened a world of books and culture. The education I got in the Guild Room made me understand more about the laws of the country, about literature and religion too. It altered the whole course of my life. Ideals, opportunity, education, better food and real savings. Cooperation certainly helped the Whitaker family and many others like them. Its influence spread far beyond Rochdale in 1844. Patty Caldwell summing up what the cooperative movement did for working class families. Today, cooperatives are flourishing not just the chain of co-op stores in the high street, but small cooperatives giving ordinary people new opportunities. Mainly that you've got a bit of control over your own destiny, you know, rather than uh, working for somebody else and just having to do what they think all the time. You know. You're able to direct what direction the, 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 the co-op goes into? I think the only hard point is um, getting someone to loan you some money to begin with, yeah? Well, it's uh, certainly <laughs> beat sitting at home uh, waiting for something to show up. Radio History was presented by Julie Lloyd and narrated by Patty Coldwell. Taking part were Joe Dunlop, Diana Davis, Jill Schilling, Tim Munro, William, Colling, William Collins and Henry Stamper. And that's the end of school's nighttime broadcasting for this evening. <laughs>